I'm actually pretty happy to have this last time slot because I don't have to compress this into 15 minutes. I can keep you guys here for about 45 minutes or until you walk out on me. Well, anyway, so uh, when I worked at Cascade Microtech, I think I put together now, this is the sixth micro app about the WinCal product. And I always was very selfish, I say, because as an applications engineer, what I wanted to do was essentially very well document FAQs. And so that's what this one also is. And I think it's the most interesting one I've done in the years. And it's regarding this calibration type that is called the short open load reciprocal through calibration. And just to put in perspective where this was coming from and what it's all about is uh, Cascade Microtech makes probes for probing wafers generally, impedance standard substrates, which are in the middle, and then in concert with the vector network analyzer, it achieves really uh, the best, most accurate, and simplest calibration possible. So that's just understanding where and this is coming from in the context of this. Okay, so SOLR was first published as a IEEE paper by Andrea Ferraro 21 years ago. Actually, I spoke to Andrea this week, and he wasn't able to make this, so he wants a copy of my PowerPoints. But um, anyway, so what SOLR is, is a type of calibration for vector network analyzers that uses the exact same physical CAL standards um, as, say, short open load and through. But what's really unique and valuable about SOLR is it doesn't require the through to be described very well. So in general, when you do a calibration, your standards have to be known, right? And, you know, even if you're making a balance scale uh, and you're trying to compare something against a, 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 a reference weight, that reference weight is the known. Well, what's most valuable in this VNA calibration is that there's no prior knowledge that's required for the uh, through. The only requirement is, is that it be reciprocal. And all that really means is that S21 equals S12 for the through, which is true always for anything that's a passive structure, structure that would be typical on, say, an impedance standard substrate or possibly even something implemented on a wafer. Well, the, the real value here also is sometimes you'll have through structures that can never be described by length and loss, you know, simple characteristics. How would you describe the characteristics over a broad frequency of something that for a ground signal ground probe has unequal length ground paths? It really just doesn't have any well describable behavior. The other application for the microprobing world is when you're probing both sides of a device, you don't have the opportunity to have a single surface to probe with two probes. So how do you accomplish the through when you have probes facing each other, maybe from the top and from the bottom? It's sort of this impossible case. Well, anyway, so SOLR is this handy tool in your kit, I say. And what I wanted to do with this was to explore just how poor the through could be and get a good cow. And I, I always was encouraging customers, you know, just simply do the reflex standards, the short open loads. Then you put your device under test in place, use it as the through, and then you're already in contact to your device and make measurement. And then basically the problem was customers wouldn't believe me that it would work. So that, that's what this is in a sense, is an exploration of how well it will work with even a really, uh, a really poor through. So I, I would actually encourage you not to read this. I'd rather have you look at me because it's really an eye chart, but I'll explain the methodology. The methodology here was to begin with what I thought was the best calibration possible with a pair of probes then measure the through that is in question. And I probed maybe eight different throughs, as you'll see in the next progression of slides. So what I'm doing then is I'm storing a reference measurement of the through so I can compare later when I do the SOLR calibration. Well, with probes still in contact on the, the through, what I could do is basically go to the vector network analyzer and turn correction off. So now I've got raw measurements of the through, simply read that, but then compute the SOLR with the existing short open loads I already had stored away, all these raw measurements that you use for computation. Then finally, still probes in contact on the through, push the SOLR calibration error set to the VNA, 
and do a final measurement with SOLR as the calibration in place. So again, it's comparing the LRRM calibration, which is probably the best probe calibration available, then effectively comparing it to the SOLR calibration, and then looking at how they each see the through. Okay, so then what I put on this slide is normally when you hear someone say, hey, I wanted to go and just remeasure my Cal standard, it's like, stop, stop, this doesn't make sense especially if it's something like SOLT. If you go and remeasure CAL standards, and they're even flawed CAL standards, they will look perfect after an SOLT calibration because the calibration math forces it to be true. But in the case of uh, SOLR, there's no prior knowledge of the through. So if you go remeasure it, it's not um, defeating this, uh, this rule that you say you, not to remeasure CAL standards because it's treated as an unknown. So that's the beauty of this whole methodology. So now let's look at the data. This is where I, I got into exploring this. And, and literally, this is the sequence of measurements I made while I tried to find just how poor, or how crappy the through could be and still get a great calibration. So to begin with, an ideal through, a one picosecond long through that would be very normally used. And the scale here is hard to see, but this is 0.2 dB going up to 1 dB. So really, these look like, you know, there's some deviation, but it's like a little less than 0.1 dB deviation across 40 gigahertz, okay? So it's really quite a good comparison. And in this corner, we're looking at magnitude. This corner, I basically put it as a phase plot because we have to look at both corrected magnitude and corrected phase, which they both agree quite well. And I left the other ones as Smith charts just so you could look at the reflect parameters, S11, S22. Okay, so this, the first one is, you know, is not, no big surprise. The second one, what I did is I took, and you see in the photograph there, two ground signal ground probes, but intentionally not landing one of the grounds. I've got basically a probe that was meant to have the coplanar waveguide structure with GSG, ground signal ground, but leaving grounds not touching anything. So it's not a really ideal through. And if you look at the magnitude in the upper right-hand corner and the phase in the lower left-hand corner, this worked perfectly. No big surprise, because it's not a very poor through. So then I go deeper and deeper in how poor the through can be. So I uh, used a device that was laid out on a ceramic substrate that's a 10 dB attenuator. And you can see on the scale here, yeah, minus 10 dB. All right, but again, the magnitudes and the phases track perfectly. So life is still good. I haven't broken SOLR yet. So let's go to even worse and worse throughs. So a 20 dB attenuator. Um, it still looks very good. There's a little bit more noticeable phase deviation, but still it's about a degree of phase. That's, that's pretty good. So 20 dB attenuator doesn't break SOLR. So how about a 20 dB attenuator, but pr probed inappropriately again, and with ground signal ground probes, but really a, a configuration on the substrate that was meant to be probed as ground signal. So it's a lot crazier behavior. It, it rolls off, but still, the, the blue trace is the reference, the gold trace is the SOLR, and they're right on top of each other. So still, we haven't broken SOLR, even with an inappropriately uh, probed 20, BD, 20 dB attenuator. So then, uh, at this point, I was getting beads of sweat on my brow because I was having problems breaking SOLR, so I was looking at other things to, to probe on this general purpose substrate. And there was a set of um, mismatched loads that are also isolated. If you look at this photograph, there's literally a strip of gold down the middle. So these probes are really highly isolated, and they're on completely different loads, and the loads aren't even uh, 50 ohm loads. If you look at where these S11 and the S... 2-2 land on the Smith chart, you see the dots don't really land on the same spot, and neither one is in the center of the Smith chart, so there's probably like, you know, maybe 70 and 90 ohms, I don't know. So then, uh, but if you look at the magnitude in the upper right, and I put these, you know, thumbs up, I'm still getting really good agreement, and the thing that's most amazing is this says minus 80 dB right here, and still these guys are tracking really well, and at this point, I'm calling my old friend Leonard Hayden, I'm going, Leonard, I can't break SOLR. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it's a pretty cool cal, isn't it? So Le Leonard was the one who uh, basically brought SOLR from Andrea Ferraro's paper, and he brought it into WinCal um, maybe 15 years ago. And so, uh, so he, he's pretty proud of it. So then I do 
probes in the air, but at the same spacing that I had when I landed on the one picosecond long through. Hey, guess what? I broke SOLR. How did I break it? Do you see? The magnitude tracks fine. Probes in the air, the magnitude is about minus 80 dB, minus 70 dB, going up to about minus 40, but the phase got reversed. Okay, well, part of what you seed the calibration algorithm with when you set it up is you have to give a rough estimate of the length of the through. And it's simply so that the calibration math can lock into the correct phase at the beginning, and then it'll try to attempt to track phase across all of the frequency points. So basically, it never tracked. It was 180 degrees out across the whole measurement, simply because I gave it the wrong length estimate because I left the length estimate at one picosecond, which is that spacing of probes to probes. Well, probe to probe on an alumina ceramic substrate one picosecond through compared to probes in the air that are acting like antennas radiating to each other, the length of the through goes from one picosecond to what? Well, if the dielectric constant of alumina is about 10, and the velocity goes by the square root of the dielectric constant, then basically I'm three times faster in air than I am on the ceramic substrate. So my fix to this was to just simply change the setup parameter and say that the through estimate was 0.3 picoseconds. And then I recomputed the SOLR. I didn't have to even remeasure anything. I didn't have to regather any raw standards. And what I added to the graph over here is now a red trace. This is the red trace is with the corrected uh, length of the through estimate. So basically probes in the air, a small distance apart, is a perfectly good through for SOLR. And that, that seems quite magical, actually. And again, I'm, when I was doing these experiments, I'm like, call up Leonard again. Uh, I fixed it, but still I'm having problems breaking it. I haven't found something that really breaks SOLR yet. And uh, he gave me some coaching. He says, you need to have something that has a really good suck out, you know, really uh, or like a resonator. So I, uh, I first tried probing things that were very widely separated on the substrate. So you see what I've got is essentially two different little shorting bars and they're separated by other structures that are kind of random in between. So these probes are as far apart as I could get them and still be in the microscope field of view. And things hang together pretty well to about minus 80 dB insertion loss. And then uh, you, what you see is it gets noisier there, but what mostly happens here also is the phase just starts to fall apart. And this makes sense. At higher frequencies, these probes are still able to radiate enough power to each other to, to keep the cow locked in. But at lower frequencies, there's just not enough, uh, not enough power going from probe to probe, not enough signal there. So this was the example where I um, did what Leonard's advice was, which was to um, essentially create a resonator. And in the bottom photograph of the probes, this is simply to show what this long strip of gold looked like. And then what I did, if you can barely see it, sorry, is there's like a shiny dot. The shiny dot is where the probe burnished the gold when it touched down. So that's where that one probe was landed. The other probe was landed very near the end. So the top photograph shows the two probes in contact. Well, with that long stub hanging out the back underneath one of the probes, it, it basically is a, is a resonator. And if you were to, a ham radio type of person, you'd call this a J-lead antenna almost. Well, what this does is at some frequency, we have this this really s steep roll off and uh, basically to the limit of the dynamic range of the instrument. Well, the, what that did then is the phase was able to track perfectly and up to that same frequency that we noted here, at that frequency, then the phase got lost. Basically, the, the calibration algorithm was able to track phase and then it lost it at around 30 gigahertz and flipped 180 degrees out. So I. Uh, I called Leonard up, I said, I, I broke it. And he says, well, you could repair it too if you wanted to. I go, what do you mean? He says, well, if you just simply played some game, like you uh, took your start frequency and just added, say, five or 10 hertz to it, you could move the, how the points straddle that, that null and maybe get the phase to lock back in. And so what I did is I plotted this on a polar chart so you could really see how the phase and magnitude and how, uh, how the math got lost. And if I zoom into the center of this, these are the actual frequency points. And in blue is the correct 
progression. And what happens is right as it crosses near the center of the polar chart, <laughs> effectively, in this measurement in magnitude and angle, that's where the phase got lost. And you see just taking off 180 degrees out of the way. Well, you see how essentially the, the two closest points in the blue trace are really symmetrically around the center. This is what Leonard was suggesting, is if I simply pushed the frequencies of these two points, or maybe took the number of points from 1,000 points to 1,050 points, that then this relationship would not be so symmetrical, and maybe the math would stay locked in. But what I said also here is, well, that's kind of putting the cart before the horse. You could never know this until too late. You know, If you're trying to put together such a measurement, I don't know how you could analyze your cow and know if all you ever did was SOLR, that, that you had this phase problem. I mean, do you, do you know by signature that one, uh, one phase is incorrect? If I come back to the original plot here, would you know that the gold trace is incorrect and that the blue trace is correct on the phase plot in the lower left? You wouldn't know that ahead of time unless you had this reference like, like I did for this talk. So. Uh, so it's, it's still an interesting way that you could repair such a cow, but it's not something I think that you could predict or diagnose. Um, but still, my conclusion is, wow, what a magic calibration type, this, this short open load reciprocal through. It's quite amazing, and it solves so many problems where quite typically you can touch probes on reflex standards, short open load, but there is no practical through. Another really great um, potential application would be for a membrane probe, like the Cascade Pyramid probes, where they're all laid out in somewhat of a random arrangement. But through structures may not be at all convenient to create, especially among you know, dozens of ports. Well, simply this uh, you know, isolation to even say minus 80 dB might be good enough to complete an SOLR calibration. So my conclusion is this thing wins the blue ribbon in calibration. And probes in the air is a perfectly good through in most cases. So that's it, and thank, thanks for letting me go over.